Let's talk about patriotism tonight. Let's talk about how Democrats work. We have a packed show, Mark Robinson, Josh Hammer, impeachment, all that and so much more coming up on I'm Right. Well, we didn't impeach Mayorkas. I, I'm not, I'm not going to yell and scream. I'm not going to get my blood pressure up over something that would have been, uh, don't get me wrong, a symbolic victory, but it would have been a good victory. Let Democrats know they can feel the sting too, but we just we have too many low-T GOPers. Many of them are low-T. Many of them are blackmailed and compromised. Do keep that in mind. When your hard-right congressman tosses a vote like this, Ken Buck, and others, oftentimes, we'll never know for sure, but oftentimes it's because they've done something blackmailable and they're forced to do this. So whatever the reason is, Majorca stays, the GOP failed again, rinse and repeat, day that ends with why. Toby Keith died today. I, I, it's, I wanted to bring this up because there's a little bit of a personal feeling I have for this. And you know, have I ever come on here and talked about a celebrity death? It's not something we do. We don't do pop culture stuff. But, well, this is a little sample of Toby Keith. Never apologize for being patriotic. We lost him 62 years old, stomach cancer, terrible thing. Okay, I'm just going to say something. Maybe it'll hit home for you, maybe it won't, but back after 9-11 in this country, many of you will remember this, but back after 9-11, there was a lot of emotion going on around this country, a lot of emotion. I was a young Marine at the time. I didn't join after 9-11. I was already in the Marines. I've been in for a year or two, something like that. 9-11 happens. There wasn't a ton of pop culture support for us as we saw it. When we went to Kuwait and got ready to go into Iraq for the invasion, we did not feel really any, or I should say very much, pop culture support. We didn't feel like celebrities, like the, the entertainers, music, mu entertainers, musicians, movie stars, but we didn't feel like they were speaking for us. In fact, we felt like they hated us, but Toby Keith, took a totally different route, a totally different route than almost everyone in the music industry. He chose to write songs like Courtesy of the Red, White, and Blue, American Soldier, patriotic songs, and, well, I'll tell you this. We didn't have, this is before the war officially started, we were in Kuwait, and then George Bush declared we, in, in, we invaded, so I was there for the very, very beginning of all this. While we were over there, we only had one working stereo in our platoon. It was some little CD player. Remember CDs? Some little CD player someone had uh, sent from back home. That was the only music we had. We were in the desert, sand filled it up, trashed it. We, we very quickly didn't have any music. Have you ever been without music at all for an extended period of time in your life? I'm not even a musical person. I certainly can't sing or dance, but it's wild when you go without music for a while how much you crave it and we craved it and we had a guy i uh, don't want to name him said and talk to him before the show we had a guy in our platoon weapons platoon from arkansas a country guy and he loved Kobe, toby keith and he could sing he had a set of pipes on him and he loved brought to you courtesy of the red white and blue he loved american soldier he loved all of other all of toby keith's other songs his big hits and he loved them to the point he had memorized them. And whenever we could talk him into it, we would talk him into standing up in front of the platoon, no music, we didn't hear nothing. And he would sing us Toby Keith songs. And man, it, it was awesome. It was awesome. And it was awesome to have somebody boldly speak on behalf of America, even though, look, I most definitely was a bit naive at the time. We probably all were. I look back on that and I saw someone who cared about the country. And that is what, look, you've heard me talk about it a million times on the show. That's what we lack now. Patriotism. Patriotism is not some side issue, not some cliche thing, oh, here we go, red, white, and blue. 
patriotism, the love of your country is the essential element in remaining a country. No matter how powerful, big or small your country is, if your country is full of people who hate it, your country will fall. And if your country is full of people who love it, your country will probably remain. I love the fact that there was a celebrity, at least for a while, who just talked about America and the greatness of it. And look, I'm not going to get all misty here. I'm not an emotional person, and you know I don't do celebrity deaths, but Toby Keith, rest in peace, sir. You meant something to us at the time. And look, look, look at how far we've fallen since then. Super Bowl is coming up in, what, five, six days? Whatever. I know it's on Sunday. I just don't know whether I count the day of the, Whatever. Super Bowl is coming up this Sunday. Patriotism? No, now we live in a country where they feel the need to play the black national anthem before the actual national anthem. Now we live in the divided states of America. Now we have Black Lives Matter in the end zones and, and racism in the end zones. We have Drew Brees rocking around. Well, I think he's retired now. I don't watch the NFL anymore with a rapist's name on his helmet. That's what's happened in this country. Um, it's wild how far patriotism is, has been removed from this society. In fact, any place you see it, it almost looks out of place now, doesn't it? Think about this. Think about you know, the Grammys were just the other night. No, I didn't watch it, but the Grammys were the other night. Think how wild it would have been to have some singer get up on stage and say nothing, nothing political. Hey, I just want to tell everybody I love America. I am blessed to be here. We are so blessed to live in this country. It would have been almost odd, right? Not almost. It would have been odd. So out of place, it would have been odd. 20, 30 years, patriotism just vanished before our eyes. Now we have communists like this one in Tennessee. Representative Jones has uh, declined to say the prayer. He asked for someone else for their assistance, Leader Camper. Uh, are you asking to help him lead the prayer? Yes, sir. Leader Camper. Pledge. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. He was asked about that little display there. Justin Jones said, quote, I couldn't bring myself to join their performative patriotism as they continue to support an insurrectionist for president and undermine liberty and justice for all. You know, the truth is, I should have seen this coming a long, long, long time ago because I remember having an argument with a Democrat I knew. This is 10 years ago, maybe now. And I was talking to him about politics starting to creep into sports, speaking of the NFL. Democrat, left-wing politics, America sucks, America's evil, that kind of thing. And I remember telling him, hey, man, there, there shouldn't be any politics in sports. It should just be sports. And he looked me dead in the eye. He was serious. And he said, what do you mean? Sports is already political. They already play the national anthem and celebrate the military. Doesn't that tell you everything about how the communists see this country? It tells me everything. It tells you everything about how rotted and soulless it is. And that brings me to our politicians. I'm going I'm to wrap up with this. Uh, one last note on the Senate border bill thing that looks like it probably won't even get out of the Senate. And I want to credit you with this. Your outrage, the outrage from you was almost universal. It was universally felt to the point where they're now behind closed doors in the Senate feeling bad for James Langford, Senator Ken Dahl, because he's probably going to lose his seat in the Senate, hopefully, because of this whole thing. So it's dead, right? But I just want to remind you that Democrat leadership and Republican leadership, while the American border remains wide open, while this country is invaded with millions of criminals who have no right to be here, 
Republican and Democrat leadership came together to ensure that the border stayed open and give billions of your money to Ukraine and Israel. This is Chuck Schumer. Leader McConnell and I, who disagree on many issues, have never worked so closely together on legislation as we did on this because we both realized the gravity of the situation. These people are awful. The people who leave this nation are awful. And I know it's kind of weird to go off on that, but it's what made me miss Toby Keith. It's what made me kind of do a, oh, that sucks when I saw he died because I remember, I remember the feeling in this nation 20 some years ago and I miss it. All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I am right. The great Mark Robinson is gonna join us next before we get to Mark. I wanna, I wanna talk to you about something. Uh, you know I'm not a health freak, right? I'll be honest with you, I had a double cheeseburger about 15 minutes before I came on this show. Are there horrible things in that cheeseburger? Yes, yes there are. We abuse our livers because our livers are the ones responsible for filtering all the gunk out of our bodies, toxins, alcohol, preserves, just all the crap. So what have you done to take care of your liver? Because it's the only one you have. May I recommend liver health formula? Liver health formula, it's not pharmaceuticals. Your, your liver doesn't need any more of that. It's all natural. Keep yourself healthy. You change the filter in your car, you change it in your coffee, you change it in, the, in your air conditioning. What do you do for your body's filter? Liver health formula. They offer a free bottle of omega-3s when you go to getliverhelp.com slash jesse. So go get some liver health, some omega-3s, GetLiverHelp.com slash Jesse. We will be back. Call me crazy. Like those of us who believe in the Almighty, who have seen his works in our lives, who have seen his works in this nation, and know, and know that through his wisdom and through his strength, and through his divine intervention, which we pray for continuously on a daily basis, that this nation, no, I will not stop. This nation will survive. This nation will move forward. This nation will be what it, God wants it to be. And the people in it who want to destroy it, I send you a message today. There are warriors in your path. And you will have to defeat us to take this nation down because we are here, we are ready, we are willing to fight because what God has blessed us with will not go easily into the night. I love hearing Mark Robinson talk. Joining me now, Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson of the great state of North Carolina and going to be Governor, Governor here this year, if all goes well, do I have that right, Governor? You're going to move on into the, an even bigger chair? Absolutely. Good to be here again. We are. We're fighting hard to a win here in March, and then we're fighting for a big victory in November to become the, the governor of North Carolina, to partner with the people here to take this state to its next level of, of, of greatness. Patriotism is one of those things that people kind of roll their eyes at it a lot these days. But I argue all the time, Governor, I said it again tonight, it's the essential element for any country. If your country is full of people who love it, your country will thrive. And it's, if it's full of people who hate it, your country is going to have problems. And I think that's why we have so many of the problems we have now in this country, just a basic lack of patriotism. I believe so too. I believe that that wholeheartedly. That the reason why uh, folks are not patriotic is because we haven't taught them why they should be patriotic. We haven't taught them about the sacrifices that have been made for them. Uh, you know, we got to tell our young our young people about who came before them that fought uh, to ensure their freedom. Uh, those who sacrificed so much, including their lives, so that we can have all the things that we have in this nation. I think that's why patriotism is failing these days. People think it's old and think it's antiquated, but it's not. You know, a lot of people like to point out the faults of this country. Well, I've got a lot of faults of folks in my family, including some faults of my own, but we don't turn, don't turn our back on. And our nation should be the same way. 
Uh, we should be proud of where we come from and we should be proud of where we are and we should be proud of the great future we have in front of us if we continue to support the nation uh, that we have uh, been so graciously given by God. Governor, I, I, I know you know the numbers. Red states, like I, and I count North Carolina in that now, thank God, they're filling up. The population is moving to these states and in large part because they want to feel like they have some level of government on their side. People are looking to state governments now to protect them from the federal government. I can't believe that's where we are, but I think that's where we are. It, it, it absolutely is. That's exactly where we are. And I've said it uh, for, for a number of years now. I backstop to uh, this overreaching federal government we have. And, you know, it's funny, the federal government in many aspects is overreaching. But at the same time, they're not doing any of the things they're supposed to be doing and prescribed to them by the Constitution, like defending our borders. And so um, uh, the states are going to have to step in and take those things on for themselves and going to have to start pushing back against the federal government and start simply saying, no, the Constitution did not, does not prescribe the right for you to push these things on us and to carry out these agendas that you have. You know, that's part of the problem that we have with governments now and many of our systems now. Our systems are not run by law and order. They're not run by our constitution. They're not run by what's wrong and what's right, fair or unfair. They are run simply by agendas. And all too often these systems, because they're being run by agendas instead of by the right thing, uh, they're failing. Governor, how do we fight back against people who have no use for the Constitution? I mean, holding up the Constitution in the face of the modern Democrat is like holding up the Constitution to a grizzly bear that's charging you. It means as much to them. So if they don't care for it, what is it? Well, that's just the thing. Number one thing, we have to know the Constitution. We have to get the Constitution, read it, understand it. And it's not hard to understand, despite what some uh, some leftist scholar may tell you. The Constitution is not hard to understand. That's number one. So we need to get it, read it, and understand it. Number two, and this is across the board for politics in general, we need to be engaged. We, we have our right. Yes, and we are free, but we will only have our rights and only have our freedom if we take the responsible step and take the responsibility of being engaged with our with our elected. That means knowing who you're voting for, why you're voting for, and, and then holding them accountable. We have got to get back to an engaged electorate to sh ensure that our government is going in the right direction. That's how our founders designed it to be. Uh, just like when Benjamin Franklin supposedly left the hall and the lady asked him, said, well, Mr. Franklin, what do we have? And as legend goes, he said, we have a republic if you can keep it. That's exactly, exactly what he meant. The solution is that folks have to get engaged and be involved. Governor, communists love crime because it destabilizes the society. We see this in cities across the United States of America. It's friggin' awful. Cities I love, too. New York, Chicago, others. are They're trashed now because of these people. And people like George Soros and his Open Society Foundation, they keep getting involved in every race they can to ensure these cities are full of crime. Are these dirty commies getting involved in your race? Uh, I'm, I'm sure they will. They'll bring their leftist ideas yeah. to North Carolina. And let me be plain on something. I really would love to see this happen across the nation. The word liberal has been hijacked. Uh, oftentimes we say liberal, 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 and that word has been hijacked. You know, you go back and you look what a liberal a person that believes in uh, the individual rights of man and all the things really that create this country. We're talking about leftists here. We're talking about socialists. We're talking about communists. We're talking about would-be despots that if they have all the power, you have not seen brutality, the likes of which they will commit. And so we have to understand that, yes, they're going to get involved in these races. Yes, they're going to try to sway people's votes. And yes, they're doing major damage to some of our major cities. But again, I think the way we fight back against that is having it, having folks who are engaged, aware, and understand uh, what's going on so we can make sure we don't vote in those politicians that adhere to those types of uh, policies. How do we get people more engaged? You've brought it up a couple times. I bring it up all the time on this show. I can't believe how apathetic many on the right are, just normal people. They don't, they don't engage, they're not involved. It's almost like they've checked out. It drives me crazy, but it's a problem. Well, by and large, people are checking out because they're tired of milk toast politicians who refuse to stand up and tell the truth. 
folks who won't tell the truth, but instead try to just soothe people's itching ears and try to give a present a message that's quote palatable to everyone and offends no one without telling the absolute truth that needs to be told to fix the substantive problems we face. When you have a whole cadre of politicians who do that, no one is listening. People tune out. They look at it and see that's the same old thing. Those are the same old lies. What people want to hear is the unfiltered truth. And then they want to hear solutions of how we can overcome these problems. And I think the more politicians, the more elected officials out there and tell the truth unafraid and present those solutions that will bring a desired, desired result around, the more people will get engaged. Governor, can people support you? If so, how can they do that? Uh, they can go to my website, Mark Robinson for, N for NC. That's Mark Robinson, F O R N C dot com. They can find out all about us and do all the appropriate things. How about that? Governor, I appreciate it. Hope to see you in that governor's mansion if y'all have one soon. All right. Josh Hammer is going to join us in a moment. We have a lot of Trump trial stuff. Oh, the federal appeals court, Supreme Court oral arguments this week. It's going to be a whole year of this nonsense. Before we get to any of that, what have you done to protect yourself? Now, I know what you're probably saying. Well, Jesse, I have ammo. Jesse, I have a security system. Then I'm talking about your dollar. I'm glad you have ammo. But protecting a dollar that's being destroyed is not going to do you any good. What do we have? What do all of us have to guard against the politicians, to guard against the federal money printing? Trillion dollars here, trillion dollars there. What do you have? You need hard assets things you can touch and feel. There's a reason every smart investment guy says the same thing. There's a reason governments around the world, China and others, are buying up all the gold they can get their hands on right now. Do likewise. Now, you don't have to buy as much as China bought. But call Oxford Gold Group and get something, some kind of value in your hands. They'll also get it in your retirement account if the worst happens with this market, which they say it might. But call them. Just call them, hear what they have to say. 833-995-GOLD. Tell them I told you to call and they'll take care of you, okay? We'll be back. Oh, Trump owns the Supreme Court. He owns it, he owns it. If they make a decision for him, it will be terrible. It'll ruin their reputations. He owns the Supreme Court. He put on three judges. He owns the Supreme Court. If they rule in his favor, it will be horrible for them. And we'll protest at their houses. And we'll do all of the things that you see. And that puts pressure on people to do the wrong thing. What they're doing is no different than Bobby and I. They're playing the ref. I watched that. I said, man, they're really good. They're really good at it. And I just hope we get fair treatment, uh, because if we don't, our country's in big, big trouble. Well, that's not very confidence-inspiring about the Supreme Court. Joining me now, my friend Josh Hammer, host of America on Trial with Josh Hammer. He's the one keeping us up to date on all the endless freaking legal matters when it comes to Trump. Okay, Josh, let's, let's deal with this. The Supreme Court... From what I understand, oral arguments are Thursday on whether or not Trump's name can remain on the ballot. I was previously pretty confident it would. Now I'm not quite so sure what's going to happen here. So this is a huge Supreme Court argument, Jesse, on Thursday. This is one of the highest profile bits of litigation. There are a lot of lawsuits here. I'm actually pretty confident about this one for many reasons. You know, first and foremost, you know, Jesse, as as a lawyer, you have to look at who the actual counsel is, who was actually going to argue these cases, who was actually writing these briefs to the Supreme Court on behalf of their clients. And as the case may be, the lawyer, the counsel of record for Donald Trump on this case, Jesse, is someone who I've known for over a decade. He he is genuinely, with zero exaggeration, one of the brightest legal minds in this entire country. He, his name is Jonathan Mitchell. We went to the same law school. He was a former solicitor general of Texas. Just 
literally one of the nation's most brilliant legal minds. Jonathan Mitchell is the one who came up with the Texas abortion law called SB8 that had the private right of action. It was actually a law so clever that Justice Elena Kagan, who was a liberal just on the court, referred to him as some genius down in Texas. So Trump is in very good hands when it comes to this case. When it gets to the merits of what this case actually is, his opponents are making a 14th Amendment Section 3 argument that Trump engaged in insurrection or gave aid or comfort to those who did on January 6th. There are like three or four different problems with this argument. First and foremost, as anyone who watched January 6th knows, it was not an insurrection. It was not an insurrection in the legal meaning of the term. The 14th Amendment, Jesse, was ratified in 1868, three years after Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant in Appomattox. When they used the word insurrection, they meant the Confederacy, they, or they at least meant something along the lines that was legally analogous to a four year long sustained uprising to overthrow the government of the United States. Whatever you might say about January 6th, it obviously was not that. There are other legal problems with this argument as well. For starters, it is a provision that is not self-executing. Their lawyers are basically arguing that this constitutional provision automatically goes into effect. That's typically not how constitutional interpretation works. You need a follow-up subsequent bit of legislation from the Congress to actually pass a statute. They have not done so. There's only one statute called the Insurrection Act, which is not really directly on the books there. So there's a lot of other legal issues as well. But I think Trump's actually in very good hands here, Jesse. I'm happy to offer you a white pill of sorts. I actually think that this case is going to come out if I'm putting on, putting on my prognosticator hat, at least 6-3, I would argue even 7-2 with Justice Elena Kagan probably joining the, the conservatives. I actually think it could even be unanimous. I think it's that weak of an argument. I really do. Oh, well, okay. Well, that's outstanding. Let's, let's deal with the worst case scenario very quickly. What if they don't? What if they shock the world and they say, all right, you can remove Trump's name off the ballot? What does that mean going forward? Well, uh, that opens up a whole can of worms. I mean, like, you know, we're obviously in uncharted water, waters here already. We would be in doubly or triply uncharted waters if the court decides to go down that that particular rabbit hole. I mean, the most straightforward path at that point, if the Supreme Court actually rules in, in, in definitive fashion that Donald Trump is actually barred from the ballot across the country, then the simplest thing to do, uh, which is not necessarily going to happen, would be for him to simply bow out. I mean, that's that's not going to happen. Now, now here is something that else that could happen. Now, the, Jesse, Article 3 of the Constitution, Article 3, Section 1, Clause 1, refers to the judicial power. That is the power of the federal court, the Supreme Court, the appellate court, the trial court, to render judgment in certain cases or controversies properly before their court. Strictly speaking, the judicial power actually only binds the parties who are named to the lawsuit in a particular case or controversy. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you want to take the incrementalist approach, which is actually exactly what Abraham Lincoln did when it came to the Dred Scott abomination. So kind of just fast or just kind of go and rewind a little bit here. After Dred Scott happened in 1857, that was the case that said that blacks could never be citizens, that basically said that slavery was part of the constitutional DNA in America. It's one of the worst cases in US Supreme Court history. After that went down, Abraham Lincoln famously said in his debates with Stephen Douglas, and then he said during his first inaugural address as well, that he was going to respect the judgment as it pertained to Dred Scott himself because he was the named party in the lawsuit, but he was not going to take it one millimeter further. And Abraham Lincoln acted on that. He actually issued blacks to passports in the Western territories when he was president in direct defiance of Dred Scott. So what I'm trying to say here is that if Donald Trump ends up getting this horrific ruling, which I don't think he's going to, he probably could only listen to it as it pertains to the named party here. That's actually Colorado. This is an appeal from Colorado. So unless and until the Supreme Court does its dirty work and actually goes state by state, he probably could actually start going down that rabbit hole as well. Fortunately, Jesse, I do feel pretty confident that we're not going to have to go there. Okay, well, fingers crossed. All right, what happened with this federal appeals court today and Trump having immunity, but I guess they just ruled that he doesn't have immunity? I don't know what all that means, but it doesn't sound good. So you had a three-judge panel today. So the, so the way it works in federal appeals court, so some, some of the cases reach the full court, the, the Latin term being en banc for that, but most of the cases are heard before three-judge panels. So there was a three-judge panel that was drawn 
uh, a few weeks ago was when the oral argument was. You had John Sauer, the former Missouri Solicitor General. He's an outstanding lawyer as well. You know, one thing about Trump and these appeals, Jesse, he actually has some very good lawyers, um, which, by the way, um, is unlike some of the lawyers that you see on TV. Um, you know, I'm not going to name names, but some of the lawyers who are actually representing him in some of these higher profile cases are actually very good lawyers, which which is something that I, as, as a lawyer, am certainly very happy about. In any event, you had this three judge panel that heard this argument and they decided unanimously in a pure curum opinion that was unsigned. So all three of them said that they agree with the writings in this 57 page opinion. They said that Donald Trump does not does not have presidential immunity from Jack Smith's probe. The reason that this is an interesting legal question. And I actually tend to agree with Trump's lawyers on this one. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a close call. I see both sides argument. It's a close legal question. Again, it's another unprecedented, uncharted water question here. The, the question is not whether you are immune from prosecution as a sitting active president. That's undisputed policy. That goes back to a 1973 memo from Richard Nixon's Office of Legal Counsel. It was reaffirmed in a 2000 Bill Clinton era memo for the Office of Legal Counsel. That, that's undisputed. If you are a sitting president, you cannot be prosecuted, period, full stop, end of story. The, the interesting legal question is, after you go back to being a private citizen, can you then be prosecuted for actions that you took while you were a president? That is what the what the court today in a three judge panel said that actually, yes, you can be prosecuted. I, I, I find that very hard to believe, Jesse, as a as a legal matter. I mean, th think about the possible incentive structures for that. You know, in, in, in this particular scenario, Jesse, you, know, you could have had Donald Trump prosecuting Barack Obama and his national security advisor for the assassination of Anwar al-Awlaki, the al Qaeda affiliated terrorist in Yemen, who happened to be a U.S. citizen. I mean, do, do, does, the, does the left really want to open up that can of worms? So Trump's going to appeal this. It's going to get very interesting. But that was the ruling today in D.C. What does that have to do with his trial date in D.C.? That's the one. I, look, everybody knows he's going to be found guilty there because it's a communist hellhole. He has no chance at a fair trial. Tanya Chuck Kennedy said it could take place after the convention. What does all that mean? Well, recall that prior to to all of uh, all of this, the, the trial start date there was, was set for March 4th. And then last Friday, so before we heard from this three from this three judge panel, but last Friday, Judge Chuckin actually removed March 4th from the docket. So we don't actually have a new trial start date yet. And we're unlikely to get one anytime soon because this three judge panel is obviously not the last word on this subject of immunity. And immunity itself is something that has to be argued and figured out before we even start trial. So the next step here is that Trump's lawyers will decide they can either go seek review before the full DC Circuit Court, the full 13, 14, 15 judges, however, however many it is. That's what lawyers call en banc review, or they can try to skip that and go straight to the Supreme Court and try to hear the justice. I, I predict that his lawyers will probably try to stick to the DC Circuit for now and do the en banc review for the very simple reason you know, Jesse, you're a sports fan. It's it's kind of analogous to trying to run out the clock. You're basically trying to run out the clock here before November. So you, you basically just want to kind of keep on running the ball up the middle, try to take up as much time. I think going to the D.C. Circuit full court right now will do that rather than trying to skip to hop right to SCOTUS. But in any event, this is going to push back the trial date. I mean, right now, I think you're looking at at least a month and a half, two months before that trial in D.C. can get, can get started. It's just an estimate, but I feel pretty confident about that. Good. Josh, appreciate you, brother. It's the American on Trial podcast. Go download it. We have so much more about our government, how weaponized they are, Democrats. Let's dive into that in a moment before we dive into that. Let's dive into this. These criminal timeshare companies. I'm sorry. I, I think scammers are criminals. I can't stand it. They suck people in. Maybe this is your story with these timeshares. And hopefully you did enjoy the timeshare. I'm not saying timeshares are a bad thing. But then eventually everyone gets done with it. You're done with it. The kids move away. You're sick of it. You don't want to travel anymore. And you try to get out. And that's when they drop the bomb on you. Oh, sorry, you should have read the fine print. You're stuck for life. You going through this right now? Why don't you stop paying those annual fees and call Lone Star Transfer instead? Stop beating your head against the wall. I want out. I want out. Lone Star Transfer will legally and permanently get it, get you out. They put it in writing. They even give you a time frame. They put it in writing. This company is amazing. 99% of the time, they are successful. You like your odds? Call 844-310-2640. 
646 and let Lone Star Transfers set you free. All right? We'll be back. Do you remember my sky is green theory? I'm not, I'm not going to go over it again right now. Don't worry. But I think it's important everyone understands something, especially people on the right. People like you need to understand something. People like me need to understand something. When we deal with these communists on the other side, I'm really not trying to be insulting for once, I'm really not. You are dealing with someone who is probably by any legal definition insane. These people are insane. And when I say insane, I mean, look, when I, when I tell you someone's insane, what do you picture? Some guy in an insane asylum wearing a straight jacket, who thinks he can fly and the squirrels are talking to him, right? And why do, why do you say that guy is insane? You say that guy is insane because he lives in a world, in his mind, he lives in a world that is not real. The things he believes, the things he knows are not true. They're not even reality. The average American Democrat lives in a world that is not real. If you are a human being, you sit down, you watch CNN at night, MSNBC. When Democrat politicians speak, you listen. You go to a university system with a bunch of communist professors. You watch awards shows. The Grammys were just on. You turn on the NFL on Sunday. You occupy a world of make-believe, and you probably don't even realize it. That's the most stunning thing about all this stuff. These people, they're 100% sure about things that are totally insane and wrong. And a big part of this is because of communism and its devotion to lies. Commun communism has never been popular, ever. I'm talking about in nations as a whole. Even in the Soviet Union, the, 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 the original place that started it all, the Bolshevik Revolution. Even then, even though the communists won, it was not popular. It was never popular there. It was never popular anywhere. It's a sick, demonic religion of destruction and domination. Nobody really likes that. I shouldn't say nobody. Populations as a whole don't really like it. So if you're a sick, demonic religion of destruction and domination and you want to destroy everything and everyone, how do you sell that idea to people? That's a tough sell, right? Hey, elect me and I'll ruin your way of life. Probably kill you too. That's a tough sell, right? So they lie. And it's natural for them. In fact, it's just baked into the cake. They lie about everything all the time. Bold faced lies, or bald faced, I don't know how to say that, but black and white lies. Whatever they say, it's not true, it's not real, and, and they admit it with each other. With the, you can tell by memos, letters they've written to each other, recorded conversations they have. They'll, they'll constantly say things like, well, we can't let them know what we're doing, but we have to hide what we're doing. They understand their religion is sick and demonic and horrible, so they lie. Your liberal Aunt Peggy. She genuinely believes that big amnesty deal and handout to foreign nations, she genuinely believes it was a border security bill. Folks, we've got to move past this toxic politics. It's time to stop playing games with the world waiting and watching. And by the way, the world is waiting. The world is watching. They are waiting and watching what we're going to do. We can't let... We can't continue to let petty partisan politics get in the way of our responsibility. Yeah. I know you saw this little interview with Kamala Harris. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind, we already had Josh Hammer on the show. You already heard just a little brief snippet of the endless legal trouble Trump is in. He's got like 8,000 trials in New York, Georgia, and D.C., endless lawfare waged against the likely Republican nominee by the DOJ of a nation. It is, uh, look, it's an overused phrase by this point in time, but it really is banana republic stuff. You would wake up one day and you'd look on your phone and you're checking in the news and you'd see, hey honey, did you see Rwanda? They, they arrested the political opponent of the president. Only that's here in America. And so 
Dome goes on TV and warns that this might happen? Former President Trump has made clear time and time again his fight is not for the people. He fights for himself. He openly talks about his intention to weaponize the Department of Justice. I know you're screaming at the television, they're already doing that! I know you know. Remember, we're not talking about you. Liberal Aunt Peggy, she really believes that. She, in her mind, nothing's been weaponized against Trump. No, 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 no. But if Trump gets elected, he'll weaponize things. I know that's insane, and I know it's hard to wrap your mind around, but keep in mind, sane people can't understand insane people. I can't understand them. You can't. Your liberal Aunt Peggy lives in a world of make-believe. Let's talk about the book banning thing. They talk, now, keep in mind, before, before I play you the clip, book banning has become a common phrase Democrats are tossing at Republicans. What are they actually saying? What they're actually saying is they want to show pornography to your children in school. That's what they want. Remember the Florida's bill? Uh, the Democrats ended up calling it the don't say gay bill, which that's not what it was, but it was really the most basic bill ever. It said, do not show sexually explicit things to second graders. That's really all it said. Young kids, don't show them pornography. Democrats freaked that they couldn't show your children pornography. And now, liberal Aunt Peggy, in her mind, again, in her world that is not real, she really thinks Republicans want to ban books. Today, there are too many politicians trying to score political points, trying to ban books, even math books. I mean, did you ever think, even your younger teachers, did you ever think when you'd be teaching, you'd be worrying about book burnings and banning books? All because it doesn't fit somebody's political agenda. Again, the system puts out nothing but lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. And no, it's not effective on someone like you. But liberal Aunt Peggy believes these lies. She does. We share a nation with people who live in an alternate reality, people who are insane. And, the, and look, the communist, because it's just his language, he'll never stop. Everything he says is a lie at all times, and it's a lie because he knows you don't want, nobody wants what he's selling. It's a difficult situation, but that is the situation we're in. All right, before we go lighten the mood, do you enjoy our specials? I know you do. Specials on communism, on history, on this person or this general. I know you do. All of our specials. You know, if you become a First TV supporter, you can access those at any time on demand. You have to go to thefirsttv.com slash support, become a bit of an insider, have access to all of our stuff whenever you want it. Go do that now. We'll be back. All right, it's time for Lighten the Mood. And you know how I encourage you to get involved locally? We talk about it all the time on the show. Like we can sit and scream and yell and stare at our phones. Oh my gosh, what's he doing? Or we can get involved. We have to get off the couch and we have to get involved. Part of getting involved means just showing up to things. Showing up to your local school board meeting. Letting your voice be heard. Now I'm not saying you have to approach your local school board in the exact way this gentleman did, but still, I credit him. He's getting involved. Good evening, cowards. Nice to see a bunch of fat, ugly women. <gasps> oh, this... wait a minute. Oh. What? Excuse you. Okay. What? Can we see the agenda? No. 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 no, 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 no. They're no. fat, ugly no. women is what they are. Guys, Let's talk about it. Uh, We're not having that. Guys, you don't have speech. to buy. That ain't free no. speech. It's called well, free speech. Buy. Okay. That's not free speech. That's insulting. Buy. That's good. Shut <laughs> up. Hey, get involved. I praise that patriot. I'll see you tomorrow.